So now let's turn to today's speaker. Uh, Jamie Goodall is a staff historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History. She has a PhD in history from the Ohio State University with specializations in Atlantic world, early American and military histories. She's also a first generation college student. Her publications include a National Geographic bookazine, Pirates, Shipwrecks, Conquests, and Their Lasting Legacies, and Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay from the Colonial Era to the Oyster Worlds. Her forthcoming book, Pirates and Privateers from Long Island Sound to Delaware Bay, will be released in 2022. She lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and two dogs. I'll now turn it over to you, Jamie. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, so this book is kind of born out of a, a necessity, really. Um, my editor at the History Press, she approached me because my research is on pirates of the Caribbean and the Atlantic world more broadly. And she was like, you know, we don't have a Pirates of the Chesapeake book. And I was living in Maryland at the time. And she was like, would you be interested? And I was like, absolutely. I thought that I would only be researching um, the traditional pirates, you know, pirates of the golden age. So 17th and 18th century. But as I dug into the research, I found just how important pirates and privateers were not only during the colonial era, but the American Revolution, the War of 1812 um, for the Confederates during the American Civil War, all the way into the Oyster Wars, which I'd never heard about. Um, and those Oyster Wars lasted until 1959. So I found it was just absolutely fascinating. And I thought I would focus my talk today on pirates uh, in the War of 1812, um, because there, there's just this interesting aspect of, of devotion to uh, for the Americans to, to America, but also the British to uh, Britain. And it was incredibly important to have these privateers for this new nation. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we, we've come off the defeat of the British, secured independence, and this was just kind of the beginning of the new nation's concerns. At the top of the agenda was regulating trade. And the question was, how would this new nation regulate trade in a country that was pretty much founded on the evasion of trade laws? Um, and, and how could it instill respect for the enforcement of trade laws among a, a population? that was accustomed to sort of detesting it. Um, many in America, particularly among the merchant class, had taken that idea of no taxation without representation cry to really mean no taxation, no matter what. And they showed very little respect for newly established custom services. Uh, so the tradition of smuggling and illicit trading, i.e. pirates, uh, continued not only in familiar Atlantic ports, but also in new distant markets. And since much of this involved evading the commercial laws of other nations, it was sort of less of a concern to US collectors at the time. But things become kind of complicated for American trade and diplomacy during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. France, Great Britain, and their respective allies were at war for more than 20 years, which presented immense risks and also the potential for great rewards for the United States. American merchants illicitly traded with both French and British privateers in direct violation of various U.S. treaty agreements. Uh, but to the American merchants, they, they didn't believe the trade to be illicit in nature. Uh, the U.S. had declared neutrality in 1793, and therefore the merchants believed this enabled them to simply dominate the shipping of goods between the warring European powers and their colonies. But as neutral versus contraband commerce became a point of contention and Britain began to seize American vessels in 1805, uh, Britain announced that American merchants who carried goods from enemy ports would be forced to show papers stating that the goods were bound for the U.S. and if they could not produce those papers, then the British would consider the goods to be contraband and subject to seizure. American merchants incurred pretty significant losses to these British privateers who the Americans viewed as pirates. Uh, so fine line between piracy and privateering there is. 
Uh, the Americans were particularly upset at being relegated to what they believed was no better than colonial status once again. Uh, even more concerning to Americans broadly was the fact that the British increasingly considered the crews aboard these ships as human contraband. They required men to show documentation of their American citizenship, or they would be forcibly removed and impressed into the service of the Royal Navy. And since the British were suspicious of nearly all the papers, uh, given that they were pretty easily forged, many Americans fell victim to this impressment. In 1807, uh, President Thomas Jefferson instituted a series of embargoes. And the idea was, uh, at least he hoped, it would help to sort of stave off war. In 1809, when James Madison was elected president, he sort of continued Jefferson's trade prohibitions as a measure of sort of balancing out uh, feelings between the nations. These were meant to punish England and France, though, for violating American neutrality uh, by treating their trade as illicit. Unfortunately, the implications were worse for American merchants as it really criminalized a lot of their activities. Uh, realizing that these restrictions were doing anything but prevent war, uh, given that the British continued to impress Americans into the service of the Royal Navy, uh, the U.S. actually officially declared war in June of 1812. Now, the new nation was pretty ill-prepared to take on the most powerful Navy in the world. Uh, and so what we see is that they ultimately relied pretty heavily on their privateers for, for their uh, maritime successes. President Madison recognized the importance of these privateers and personally signed each commission that was granted to the privateers. Anyone who wanted a commission uh, just had to apply to the Secretary of State and submit information about the ship and its crew. Now, this letter of mark was extremely important, particularly at this time period. If a ship was captured by an enemy ship and could produce their official letter of mark, the ship would be treated as a combatant vessel, not a pirate vessel. Uh, this means that the crew would be treated as prisoners of war rather than being treated as ordinary pirates and hanged for their crimes. Uh, the use of letters of mark was specifically mentioned in the declaration of war signed by President James Madison and dated June 18th of 1812. The actions of these privateers contrasted quite sharply with the performance of the US military on land and prominent American merchants invested quite heavily in these operations and, and there go the dogs. Uh, pirates, smugglers, and and privateers would play pretty celebrated roles in the defeat of the British from the Battle of Baltimore to the Battle of New Orleans. And they ultimately kind of became these folk heroes among local populations. In particular, the privateers coming from Baltimore were a pretty intense thorn in the side of the British. London newspapers, for example, frequently denounced Baltimore specifically as a quote, nest of pirates which sent out its wasps to sting British commerce on every sea. Uh, the British attack on Baltimore in September of 1814 was, at least in part, intended to punish the city for its connections to privateers. Um, we'll, we'll just stay here. Between the end of the American Revolution and 1797, uh, over 60,000 tons of commerce passed through Baltimore and by 1800, the city was the third largest in the nation. Uh, Baltimore and Fells Point specifically became renowned for building fast, reliable ships, which were called the Baltimore Schooner. Uh, now most, if not all Baltimore Schooners at this time had one deck and two masts. Uh, both speed and a shallow draft were critical components of their design and what made them sleek and fast also made them quite difficult to sail. A Baltimore schooner required a highly competent crew, which often prevented the British from using captured Baltimore schooners against America. So it was pretty important uh, to, to facilitate that design. Between 1795 and 1835, a total of 421 schooners averaging about 116 tons were built in Fells Point alone. And they were built by just 83 different men, one of whom was a young man named Thomas Kemp. And so 
to, to sort of talk about the War of 1812 and these privateers, I'm going to introduce you to several individuals and their uh, contributions. Thomas Kemp was a Quaker from the Eastern Shore who arrived in Baltimore in 1803, and he became one of the most prolific shipbuilders uh, of the time period. In December of 1803, Kemp purchased property at the northeast corner of Market, which is now Broadway, and Lancaster Streets in Fells Point, where he and his brother Joseph built the schooner, the Thomas and Joseph. But they mostly, at that point, repaired other people's vessels. <clears throat> but, but by July of 1805, Kemp had actually saved enough money by repairing these vessels that he was able to establish his own shipyard on a property uh, which was bounded by Fountain Fleet in Washington Streets, also in Fells Point. What's interesting about Kemp and his shipbuilding is that he received all of his material locally. Uh, so his timber suppliers included local men Benjamin Bowen, Josiah Hall, and Henry Holbrook. Uh, he purchased his spars from James Cordery and Joseph Robson, uh, his beams from Lloyd Johnson. Uh, for his iron work, he turned to Philip Cronmiller, and for copper spikes and rivets, he turned to Joseph S or John S. Young. He even got his finishing supplies locally. Uh, his rosin and pitch came from John Stickney, and Kemp employed about 25 local men as carpenters and caulkers. Uh, and he described the vessels they built as round tuck privateer fashion schooners. So the, the purpose of these schooners was, was pretty obvious. Um, one of the first vessels built in Kemp's shipyard was a 99-ton schooner named Lynx. Kemp developed a reputation for building high-quality vessels known for their durability, uh, their reliability, and most importantly, their speed. No other Baltimore shipwright at the time was as prolific or as accomplished, and Kemp ultimately built 52 total ships. Uh, and he built the four most successful privateer ships of the War of 1812. Um, those were the Rossi, the Rolla, the Comet, and the Chasseur. Now, Kemp often owned shares in the privateer ships that he had built, including the Chasseur, uh, which turned out to be one of the fastest ships ever built at that time. Uh, Chasseur was granted a privateering commission in February of 1813, under the command of a man named William Wade, during which time they captured 11 enemy vessels. So it's pretty impressive when you consider that most privateers are capturing one or two. After this just sort of daringly broke through the British blockade on Christmas Day in 1813 and put in at New York a few months later, they refitted the vessel and some shares were sold to new investors, which included its new captain, Thomas Boyle. Boyle had commanded the privateer Comet when Wade served as her second officer. So you see these connections and uh, Boyle goes from one of the most successful privateer ships, the Comet, to another of the most successful privateer ships. Um, Captain Thomas Boyle uh, was actually born in Marblehead, Massachusetts, but he actually considered Baltimore his home and his contemporaries saw him as one of the most successful privateers during the war, uh, and he frequently challenged the British Navy directly, which is pretty gutsy, uh, considering the comparison between a privateer ship and a British warship. Um, he left such a trail of destruction behind him that by the time the War of 1812 ended, uh, contemporaries remarked that all of England knew his name. He aggravated the British, uh, quote, wherever he chanced to steer, carrying dismay and terror to British trade and commerce, uh, so that the comet soon became one of the chief objects of civilian and naval fear. Captain George Cogshell, who is one of Boyle's contemporaries and author of the book, The History of American Privateers, recalled Boyle as a dashing, brave man. He evidently possessed many of the elements of a great man, for in him were blended the impetuous bravery of a Murat with the prudence of a Wellington. So he, he was really impressed with Boyle. Cogshill goes on to say that had Boyle been a commander in the United States Navy, his fame and valor would have been lauded throughout the entire nation. But because he commanded a privateer, no one really spoke of him until later. Uh, Boyle's career began at the tender age of 10, working his way to master of his own ship by his 16th birthday. 
During his command as a captain of privateers, he and his men captured 30 to 60 ships, depending on which records you look at. The men first left Baltimore in July of 1812, uh, and that cruise lasted about four months. They managed to sail without hindrance from Bermuda to Brazil and back again, which I don't know how they managed to evade so many British warships. On this first venture, they managed to capture several small vessels, plunder the cargo, and seize the ships as prizes. During one of the minor skirmishes, which lasted only 12 minutes, uh, they boarded an enemy vessel, Henry of Hull, which was a 400-ton ship commanded by James Dryden with a crew of just 20 men. The ship was bound from St. Croix to London, carrying 83 hogsheads, six tierces, uh, 70 barrels of sugar, uh, 19,000 plus pounds of fustic, over 3,500 pounds of lignum vitae, and 13 pipes of Madeira wine. And so those are all different kinds of measurements for the products, the hogshead primarily carrying uh, things like tobacco or, or rum. Uh, tierces tended to, to be wine. Um, so th this was pretty uh, profitable for, for the men. Another ship, the Hope Bull of London, was sailing from Suriname and had 13 guns and about 25 men. It was a 346 ton ship, uh, but it yielded a cargo of 710 hogsheads of sugar, 54 hogsheads of molasses, 111 bales of cotton, 34 casks of coffee, and 74 bags of cocoa among miscellaneous other goods. And so some records place the value of all of Boyle's prizes from this first venture at upwards of $400,000. So pretty significant given the time period. Uh, so the men on the Comet arrived back at Fort McHenry in Baltimore in October after just 83 days. So they were able to rack up $400,000 worth of prizes in just a few months. Um, Boyle boasted that he had not lost a single man, nor were they chased even once, which again, pretty impressive. After a month's refitting, the Comet set out on the second cruise in November of 1812. At that point, Boyle and his men headed for Pernambuco in Northeast Brazil, where they arrived in early January of 1813. It was his second and third cruises which made Thomas Boyle famous. Uh, first, he completely outsailed several enemy vessels. Uh, second, he easily defeated a Portuguese naval brig, which was escorting three English ships bearing wheat to England. And when Boyle spoke uh, with the commander of the Portuguese chaperone, uh, he remarked that they, quote, were upon the high seas, the common highway of all nations, that he, meaning the Portuguese, had no right to protect them, the British, and that the high seas of right belonged to America as much as to any other power in the world, and that all events under those considerations, he was determined to exercise the authority he had and capture those vessels if he could. And that's what he did. After a brief cruise, Boyle and his men caught up to three other English vessels and seized each of them one by one. And third, he took more than 20 prizes and engaged in a controversy with the governor at St. Bart's about taking uh, wood and water while he was refitting. Uh, Boyle's venture was so successful that he was becoming overburdened with prisoners. Uh, so he had to return to Baltimore again when uh, he arrived in mid-March and again experiencing no difficulties in passing through the British blockade uh, at the head of the Chesapeake Bay. Now in the spring of 1814, Boyle left the command of the Comet and in July of 1814 became commander and part owner of Chasseur. And again, Chasseur was considered one of the most uh, important privateers of the war. It had 16 12 pound guns and carried over 100 officers, seamen, and Marines. Um, despite being outnumbered at various points, Boyle and his men would slip through uh, blockades and disappear. For several months, they sailed through the English Channel and along the coasts of Britain and Ireland, where they captured 18 prizes. Um, and kept nine of them at least, uh, bringing them back to the States um, and kept over 150 men prisoner. 
Uh, his depredations were so bothersome that the Morning Chronicle of London remarked that the whole coast of Ireland from Wexford Round by Cape Clear to Carrickfergus should have been for above a month under the res unresisted domination of a few petty fly-by nights from the blockaded ports of the United States. And, and they argued that this was a grievance that was intolerable and totally disgraceful to the British. Uh, the success of Chasseur and other American privateers severely affected British morale and caused their insurance rates to skyrocket. And some underwriters even refused to insure the ships uh, and their cargoes because they felt like it was an imminent loss. So what was the point of insuring them? Um, now, unlike his time on the Comet where he did not lose a single man uh, or find himself in any uh, terrible skirmishes, uh, this time he, he did find himself in, in a bit of a pickle. Um, but the Treaty of Ghent technically ended the war uh, in December of 1814. Unfortunately, news of the treaty hadn't quite reached Boyle, uh, much like what happened to Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. And in February of 1815, uh, Boyle and his men came across uh, HMS St. Lawrence. And it had been a boat built in Philadelphia, captured as prized by the British. And uh, Boyle was like, absolutely not. We're taking this back. It belongs to us. Uh, a pretty significant battle uh, occurred. There was a lot of damage to the Chasseur, um, but they they managed to damage the HMS St. Lawrence worse. And so um, reportedly the British had 15 men who were killed and 19 who were severely wounded, while Boyle had just five men killed and 19 wounded. Um, the Niles Register dubbed the Chasseur the pride of Baltimore and today, uh, a replica design of the Pride of Baltimore II actually sails throughout the, the bay. Um, and Boyle himself earned uh, upwards of $30,000 from his cruises, because you have to remember that all of the money he earned was split between the uh, investors of the boat, the government, and all the men on board the ship. So for him to earn $30,000 himself, that's that's all. That's a lot. Um, I want to introduce you to one of the men who served on the Chasseur as a gunner during the famous blockade of England in August of 1814. And that was a free black man from Baltimore named George R. Roberts. And, and I want to talk about him because we, we tend to forget about the contributions of, of black Americans, particularly black men during this time period, um, especially given uh, the heavy presence of, of slavery. Uh, so we tend to not think about the uh, Black individuals outside of that. Um, but Captain Boyle noted that Roberts, quote, displayed the most intrepid courage and daring uh, and later was highly thought of by the citizen soldiery of Baltimore. Uh, he was even one of the few defenders of Baltimore, as they were called, to have his portrait taken by a photographer, uh, which is uh, what you can see here. Before serving on the Chasseur, Roberts was a member of a privateer called Sarah Ann, and uh, this gave him a lot of experience in terms of, of how to evade enemy vessels, um, what was profitable and what was not profitable. Um, at one point, he was among six American seamen who were accused of being British subjects and taken prisoner. Uh, they were brought to Jamaica in irons, uh, and of course, the men denied being British. And the captain of the ship even said, you know, Roberts was, uh, he said, I know him to be native born of the United States and of which he had every sufficient document together with his free papers. Um, and uh, so ultimately the prisoners are exchanged, uh, which is most fortunate for Roberts because a lot of privateers who were black, whether who were free or had escaped slavery, if they were captured, they were often sold into slavery. Um, so it was very dangerous for these black men to serve on these privateering vessels. Um, it's not known what Robert's profession was after he served on the Chasseur, uh, because there are pretty scant records uh, of him after that. But we do know he became a local hero and he was allowed to participate as one of the old defenders of Baltimore uh, during parades uh, throughout the years, which commemorated the anniversary uh, of the uh, blockade. 
According to one of the local newspapers upon Robert's death in 1861, uh, they said, though laboring under the weight of so many years, his carriage was erect and he never appeared on parade except in uniform. And it was one of his highest aspirations to still be considered one of the defenders of his native city should the necessity have arrived to take up arms in its defense. The deceased was one of the crew under the command of Captain Thomas Boyle of this city in the privateer Chasseur when Captain Boyle declared the coast of Great Britain under blockade. He served during the war under several commanders and generally at sea, and he had in the service many hairbreadth escapes. Um, so he, he was revered uh, among the population and Roberts wasn't the only Black Marylander to serve as a privateer in the War of 1812. Uh, he's joined by men like Percy Sullivan and Henry James of the Tartar, Charles Ball, who fought at the battles of uh, St. Leonard's Creek, Bladensburg, and Baltimore with the U.S. Chesapeake Flotilla, and Gabriel Rulson and Caesar Wentworth, who served respectfully or as landsmen and cook in that Chesapeake Flotilla. Of course, there are countless other um, Black individuals who in addition to serving aboard privateer ships were mechanics who kept the vessels afloat or, um, you know, helped the ships uh, unload when they would come back from, from venture. So um, George Anderson, Solomon Johnson, Elisha Rohde, Jack Murray are just a few of those men who served in Fells Point. And many of them also became old defenders of Baltimore. Um, so I, I thought I would talk for 30 minutes. Apparently I'm going a little over that. Um, probably the most significant of the Baltimore privateers, though, was Joshua Barney. And I'm going to try to keep his story pretty short. Um, he was born in Baltimore County, Maryland, which I found to be very fun since I lived at that time in Baltimore County while I was writing the book. And he had been a naval hero of the Revolutionary War. He had joined the Navy um, <clears throat> at the age of 13 and he was in command of his own ship also at the age of 16. So, you know, here we are. I was not that impressive at 16 years old. So uh, although he'd become a merchant after the American Revolution, he felt the patriotic call of duty and volunteered to serve again when war broke out in 1812. He was officially commissioned as a privateer to board a ship called Rossi by Madison himself. And he immediately built on his earlier naval successes, um, frequently raiding British ships on the open ocean, and he received pretty, pretty significant uh, press attention. Um, but despite his success as a privateer, the ventures themselves weren't always as profitable for Barney's and his men as for some other privateers. Um, so Barney decided to shift gears. He was like, uh, I'm tired of being out on the open water. Let's, let's do some damage in another way. He approached the United States Secretary of the Navy, William Jones, in 1813, and he requested that he be allowed to build a special squadron or a small flotilla to specifically protect the vital waterways of the Chesapeake Bay, because at that point, the bay had been pretty much at the mercy of the Royal Navy, who was practicing unrestricted warfare against the men and women of the Maryland and Virginia Tidewater. Uh, for example, the U.S. Navy uh, was blockaded in the Elizabeth River by the British, uh, which meant that those in the Chesapeake really kind of had to fend for themselves uh, for those who were along the, the coast. Um, so Barney's plan kind of came at a good time uh, because the British had just authorized its commanders to, quote, devastate and ravage the seaport towns of the Chesapeake. And so he was granted permission to, to create this flotilla. Um, the Chesapeake Flotilla was also known as Barney's Flying Squadron, and it was essentially kind of a floating gun barge. Uh, they were capable of quick maneuvering and were designed specifically to harass and distract British warships in the Chesapeake Bay, drawing their attention away from these coastal towns and cities. Um, by the end of April 1814, Barney was actually made a captain in the U.S. Navy, despite being a privateer, and uh, he. Um, led this flotilla to fulfill their mission. Um, because of their speed and their maneuverability, the Chesapeake flotilla got the nickname the Mosquito Fleet. And I believe other small flotillas that operated uh, throughout the War of 1812 got the, a similar nickname. Um, but again, uh, the crew was made up of both white and black men. Uh, and they were cruising the Chesapeake 
and they came across several British warships and they made the decision to pursue, pursue one of them uh, and try to cut it off. Uh, but uh, the American flotilla ended up retreating into the Patuxent River and the British blockaded it. Uh, Barney and his men were severely outnumbered, about seven to one. Uh, so that forced the flotilla to retreat further into St. Leonard's Creek. Um, the creek was too shallow, fortunately, for the British warships who were now encircling them uh, from entering that particular area. So that enabled the flotilla to kind of hold steady until they figured out what to do. Uh, but of course, the warships send their small boats to engage the flotilla, but the flotilla outgunned those. So again, pretty fortunate. And the Chesapeake flotilla continued for several days when the British, who were pretty frustrated by the flotilla's ability to thwart their efforts, instituted what can only be described as a campaign of terror. Uh, they destroyed towns and farms and plundered their way through uh, Calverton, Huntington, Prince Frederick, Benedict, and Lower Marble, Marlborough. Uh, conflict ensued for a few more weeks before Barney and his men were joined by U.S. Army Colonel Decius Wadsworth and the U.S. Marine Corps uh, under Captain Samuel Miller. So this this enabled Barney to feel pretty emboldened uh, and want to attempt to break the British blockade. Um, having a simultaneous attack from both land and sea allowed the flotilla to sort of move out of St. Leonard's Creek and at least up to Benedict, Maryland, uh, although Barney did lose two gunboats uh, during that escape. Um, of course, the British, very angry at this. And they entered the creek and burned the entire town of St. Leonard, Maryland, before they moved up the Patuxent River to Benedict following the Chesapeake flotilla. Now, the Secretary of the Navy, very concerned that the flotilla might fall into British hands, which would give them even more advantage in the Chesapeake. So he ordered Barney to take the flotilla as far up the Patuxent as he could to Queen Anne and to scuttle the entire flotilla should the British approach. Um, so following these orders, uh, Barney left the barges near Pig Point with about 100 men who were left behind to destroy the ships should uh, the British uh, arrive. Uh, fortunately for Barney and, and his men, um, there was about 16 ships who had blocked the channel, uh, which destroyed, you know, when they destroyed the, the flotilla, uh, these ships prevented the British from moving further inward. So um, it was important to blow those ships up. So despite the loss to the Americans uh, of these ships, uh, it was pretty beneficial in the long run. Um, during the battle, Barney had received a bullet to his thigh that needed tending to, but unfortunately the bullet had lodged so deep in his thigh that it was never able to be extracted and complications set in and he actually died in Pittsburgh in 1818. And I got to tell this story uh, to the daughters of the War of 1812, uh, a local group. And uh, one of the women who was there was a descendant uh, of Joshua Barney. And so um, we, we got to compare notes, which was really, really interesting. Um, there are tons of other characters uh, in the book. If you would like to check them out, uh, you can find... Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can buy directly from Arcadia Publishing um, or, you know, use a, a, a site called IndieBound to help you find a local bookstore that can help you get the books. You can shop small and support local. Um, and so that book is sort of broken up. The entire book is broken up in the story. So you don't have to read from beginning to end. Um, you can sort of skip around however you want to. Um, I will note, I messed up a little bit and said Sam, uh, Sam Bellamy died, uh, by hanging, but he actually died during a shipwreck. So, you know, my bad, uh, we'll fix that in future editions. And I, I have, as mentioned, a forthcoming book, uh, which focuses on primarily the colonial era, but also touches on the American revolution in the region of, uh, New York and Pennsylvania, sort of the middling Atlantic colonies and later states called Pirates and Privateers from Long Island Sound to Delaware Bay, which actually releases in May. And I believe you can pre-order it right now on Amazon. I'm not sure if the pre-order is on the press website yet, um, but you can also wait a little bit uh, 
and try to get that from an indie bookstore, which would make my heart happy. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you um, for remembering to plug your book. That was going to be my first question if you if you missed it. Um, so a quick reminder uh, for you, we talked about this earlier, but also for our audience, um, there is a lag between what we're seeing here on Zoom and what our audience is seeing on YouTube. So um, we do our best to get to all the questions, but sometimes they sort of pop up after we're done and that sort of thing. So we'll do our best. So uh, please bring those questions forward um, and we'd love to hear them. So we'll start with uh, a question um, from Ben. Um, he was asking about uh, rank equivalents. So um, if you are, for example, a, a captain, um, a privateer captain, would you have any um, equivalent rank in the Navy or would you have to take orders from, from a U.S. Navy Admiral? Um, was there any crossover like that? How did that work? Uh, so from my understanding of, of the system, um, the privateers are operating distinct from the, the, from the Navy. Um, they are commissioned directly by the president. Um, so they are not under the command of anyone in the Royal or in the, Royal, in the American Navy. Um, this does not mean, however, that a lot of uh, Navy uh, admirals and, and captains would not try to assert authority over privateering vessels. Um, that did happen. And of course there was conflict over who, who had the greater authority. But for the most part, I found that the, the American Navy uh, sailors and, and captains and such actually cooperated quite well with, with the privateers because they were, you know, they were fighting the same war and they, they each had their own purpose, right? The naval vessels were there to directly engage British warships and, and that sort of thing, while the privateers, primarily their job is to disrupt trade and to weaken um, the resources uh, of their enemy. Um, so there wasn't a lot of overlap generally. As far as rank, I do not think uh, that there was rank equivalency uh, because there was no direct connection between the Navy and the privateers. Uh, Barney was kind of the, the odd instance of getting a uh, naval rank. Uh, but I think that was because he had served in the Navy during the revolution. And so it was sort of like a continuation of his service. Um, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, I just did not come across in my research any uh, definitive uh, arguments about equivalent ranks or, or anything like that. So following up on that a, a little bit, um, at, certainly at the beginning of the war, you said there was um, almost a focus on, on the privateers. Um, and I don't want to, um, as a Canadian, I don't, I, I don't want to disparage the, the record of the U.S. Navy. But I wonder, do you, do you feel that um, the focus on privateering hurt um, the U.S. naval effort in any way? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, um, you know, for, for manpower, and if you've got these incredible commanders, if they're focused on the privateering side, is that sort of taking away from the, from the U.S. Navy? Um, actually, yeah, it, it does. Uh, there were uh, several people um, who complained uh, that so higher ranking individuals who complained that they, they just couldn't get people to volunteer to join the Navy because, uh, it was more profitable personally for them to join a privateering vessel, uh, because the rewards could be much greater. Therefore the division of, uh, money could be much greater. Whereas the Navy vessels, um, they, they had a, a set wage. And if the Navy were to capture enemy prizes, uh, it went straight to the government as opposed to privateers, which had like this division structure. Um, so it did weaken the, the naval effort to a degree uh, in terms of manpower, especially. Um, but I think it's really supplemented in other ways in the sense that the American Navy did not have enough ships to really manage on their own. And so by allowing these private vessels to support them, uh, I think it enabled the Navy to focus on the conflicts or, or the missions that were most important to uh, the war effort. 
Uh, also, uh, it, it was sort of interesting because uh, after the War of 1812, there is this push to, uh, when the treaty is signed, there is this push by several uh, government officials to ban privateering from future wars. Um, and the uh, government ultimately said, no, we're, we're not going to ban them, uh, which proved to be pretty important for uh, later. But uh, we don't see the United States ban the use of privateers until the end of the American Civil War, uh, which is interesting because I think in the mid 1700s or so, uh, the European powers uh, had issued a, a sort of ban on privateering uh, during a, a treaty. Uh, and so the Americans, you know, part of this and they were like, America, are you going to sign? And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> We, we need them. So uh, yeah, I think they did hurt the Navy in some ways, but I think ultimately they, they were very helpful as well. Thank you. So speaking of prize money, um, <laughs> I wonder if you can tell us what happened to Thomas Boyle after the war. He, he gets his $30,000 and, um, you know, does he go on to become a great Virginia gentleman? How, how does this change his life? To be honest, I don't have much on Boyle after the war, um, partially because I didn't look that that heavily. <laughs> um, so I'm sure there's evidence out there and, and it's something I would definitely like to look into for uh, future projects. But what I believe happened to Boyle is that he did. He took that money. He invested uh, probably in, in a plot of land and his family and that sort of thing. So um, I don't know that he ever became like a, a notable, well-known gentleman, but he certainly was uh, an important figure in his local community. But I don't have much about his actual um, activities post-war. That's fair. Um, little, a little outside your, your purview, but um, so I'm trying to remember, I did read your book, I think over the Christmas holidays, but uh, yeah. Rob brings up an interesting question. <laughs> Um, uh, female pirates, was, was that a thing that you've, uh, pirates or privateers, was that something that you've encountered? So it's complicated. <laughs> um, so I will say that in the Chesapeake Bay, I did not come across any evidence, uh, directly tying women to privateering or piracy in the sense of them acting as pirates or privateers on board a ship. Um, with one exception, during the Oyster Wars, uh, and this was one of my favorite stories from the book, uh, Governor Cameron of Virginia is waging these Oyster Wars against uh, these Oyster Pirates. And he comes across this ship called the Dancing Molly. And he had just lost a few uh, pirate vessels that he had thought he was going to capture. So he's really upset and he sees this vessel and it's this prime opportunity for him to, to sort of uh, make up for his losses because he noticed that the pirates, the men, uh, were on the, the island uh, and they were gathering timber and he was like, all right, great. The men are on this island. They have nowhere to go. They might have left one guy on board the, the boat, but it can't go anywhere. Uh, so he uh, launches some warning shots and, and speeds towards the dancing Molly. But what he didn't know is that the pirate captain had brought his wife and two daughters with him. And my assumption based on this particular story is that they were kind of frequent um, guests aboard the pirate ship and, and that they kind of engaged in this oyster pirating. Uh, and Fortunately for the men and the women of the Dancing Molly, they, uh, the women turned out to be quite skilled seafarers themselves. And so they were able to use the wind and, and such to their advantage. And they outsailed the governor and managed to go from Virginia waters uh, and cross into Maryland waters uh, before the governor could capture them. And so he, they were outside of his jurisdiction, of course. And it was pretty embarrassing for Governor Cameron because he had brought three press members on board with him to to chronicle his success. And, and instead they end up chronicling his, his dismal failures. Um, so they were the only direct case I found in terms of the Chesapeake while I was researching. But I will say 
women were incredibly important to the uh, operation and success of pirates because we tend to have this idea that pirates were these single swashbuckling daring men who just wanted adventure or they were down on their luck. But the reality is, I would say the vast majority uh, of pirates were actually just average men. And most of those men had wives, had children, were uh, intimately tied to their communities. And so those women, uh, by holding down the, the fort, so to speak, and, and helping their husbands or their brothers or sons or whatever out, uh, they were an integral part of, of those pirates being successful. And uh, there's even a case, um, Daphne Giancopolis has this book uh, called The Pirate Next Door, I think. And she uses four case studies to sort of talk about the role that these women play uh, in these men's lives. And she came across this petition by uh, hundreds of pirate wives, I guess. And they were petitioning the government for the re release of their husbands who had been convicted of piracy and sentenced to hang, um, which is really interesting just seeing women intervening at, at a, a legal level on behalf of their husbands. So uh, while I did not find, you know, the equivalent of Anne, Bonnie and Mary Reed, unfortunately, um, I would still say that women were incredibly important in the realm of piracy and privateering. Fascinating. Thank you. I think that's uh, a great place to leave it. That kind of ties in nicely with some of our other uh, themes for today. So um, I'm just going to say uh, thank you very much. Uh, a really interesting perspective on, um, you know, a little more in uh, um, our wheelhouse from from Tom and I perspective, the War of 1812, but very uh, different perspective. So thank you very much for that. And I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. And Tom's not quite done. I got a couple of questions of, of my own, or I see another one that's turned up in the chat. Uh, first, Paul asks, how is the sale of a prize divided amongst the, the crew of a privateer? So it depended. Um, primarily what we see is that I want to say uh, 50 to 75 percent of the prize money was divided between um, the crew and the investors. And I think the government got like a 25 percent ish cut. Uh, and that changed over time uh, because the government realized that uh, to incentivize privateering, they needed to take a smaller cut and give the privateers and investors a greater cut. Um, so I will say the percentage kind of changes over time. As far as the crew itself, um, they the prize money would often be divided based on your um, job or, or your position on the ship uh, and how much you've contributed to, to the operation. Um, so of course the captain gets a, a slightly greater cut uh, than the rest of the crew, but for the most part, the, the crew kind of splits it fairly equally. Um, it's a little different than, than pirates who, who divvied the loot up totally equally. Um, so, uh, yeah, it just, just kind of depends. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think it's amazing how far a sea they, they went, you, you know, you referenced a blockade of the UK. You talked about, I think it was Boyle, like off of Brazil, uh, like it's just, incredible how, how far they traveled uh, but also during the war of 1812 it wasn't just american privateers at, at sea like uh, there was also atlanta canada there was privateers fighting on the british side did you have a sense for how much activity there was there what what their effectiveness was yeah uh, so the british privateers and, and those they uh engaged to become privateers on their behalf um, they, they were a big thorn in the American side as well, um, disrupting uh, American commerce uh, that was trying to, to go across the Atlantic. I don't have a sense of exactly the scale of that. I would say, at least based on what I was researching, that um, the American privateers had a slightly more uh, detrimental effect on the British than vice versa. Um, and I think that's probably primarily because um, the each side had kind of a different 
purpose in, in entering the war and, and your intention uh, and your goals can kind of dictate um, your approach to uh, military strategy and naval strategy. So um, I think they were both on both sides, very uh, detrimental to the other, but I, I think the Americans kind of outsailed the British a bit, um, at least at various points during, during the war. All right. Thank you. So this time I, I really will let you go. So thank you so much for joining us today. That, that was uh, very informative, fascinating, um, just like just like your book, which I'd also recommend to our audience. Um, so for our audience, we're going to be back at, at one o'clock Eastern time. So uh, we'll open the live stream about 10 minutes before one. You know, if you're just leaving the YouTube channel open, uh, I suggest you start refreshing about 10 minutes before the hour and make sure that the, the live stream's popping up on your screen. It, it may not just automatically show up. So Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, uh, another great talk. Well, we're already halfway through our day here. So look forward to having you join us this afternoon. So take care. Thank you. Thank you.